Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for joining me again, Fading Memories listeners. If you are following me on Instagram, you probably know today's guest. I am delighted to have Adria from Be Light Care. She has a zillion great videos on Instagram. She puts me totally to shame. <laughs> and they're very helpful. So if you're not following her, I have linked her account in the show notes. But thanks for joining me, Audria. I did say that right, didn't I? It's it's Adria. Adria. Okay. Well, Adria. I, didn't, yeah. I didn't butcher it too bad. I'm really good at butchering names. And we've had contractors working on our deck recently. And my husband is called, it's a not a husband, it's a father-daughter team, and my husband has referred to the daughter by three different names, so I'm just going to call her, <laughs> hey you, because it's like, <laughs> girl whose name starts with A is about as far as I can get, because it's like, dude, I'm already bad enough with names, please don't tell me her name is April, August, and I forgot what the third, they all started with A, so he's at least close, but I'm like, dude, you know I'm bad with names, so. That's okay, I'm yeah, I, I answer to pretty much anything. I, I get a lot of like Adrian, Andrea, but yeah, it's Adria. Okay, so yeah. I was I was at least ninety five percent right. You were yes, you were. So you are a speech and language therapist, is that correct? I'm trying to remember right. the videos. Oh, good. Hey, some brain cells work. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, I'm a I'm a speech language pathologist, which is the same thing as a speech therapist. Okay. I wasn't sure. I was like, pathologist seems like it's in the title, but mm -hmm. for some reason I was having a little brain block on that one. So have you cared for somebody with dementia or, or Alzheimer's? Good. Now my tongue's going to not work. <laughs> so in my, I've been a speech language pathologist for eight years and I've been working in skilled nursing and assisted living communities, including memory care facilities. So I provide one-on-one speech therapy services to people with dementia. Uh, but my grandmother also has dementia. So I have I know it from a personal and professional point of view. Cause I think probably 97% of my guests have all had personal experience. It's kind of rare to not for them not mm -hmm. to. So that's mm -hmm. why I wanted to ask that. So I don't know if you've read enough of my posts, but my, you know, my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. Her mom had mixed dementias and my maternal great grandmother had dementia so great mm. family history so i do everything lots i can of, yeah lots of personal experience there fortunately my great grandmother died before i was born and i didn't have a lot of experience with my grandmother just enough to like realize that this was really hard mm -hmm. um some of it was funny but my aunt did 99 percent of the care for her and then my dad did most of it with my mom until he passed away and then my sister and i or obviously responsible for mom and being the oldest one. I, <laughs> I was the one that got, you know, I don't have kids at home anymore. So I, I was the primary sure. and, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot of things I wish I'd known 10 years earlier. There's so much more that we've known since maybe 2015 to, you know, 2022 right now that it's like, ugh, it's so much better than it was when my mom was first experiencing symptoms my mom waited till she was at the middle stages to finally allow herself to be diagnosed mm. so she she was a challenge and my dad was a challenge so when yeah. we were talking about what you do i said yes i'd love to have you on the show because i've always been a skeptic so <laughs> just for the people who are listening i'm gonna challenge adria because mm. i've been a skeptic her videos have helped me learn that maybe my skepticism is misplaced but I'm gonna, we're going to play devil's advocate a little bit today, mostly because all of my experiences with people with any form of dementia would basically tell you to go pound the sidewalk, <laughs> to put yeah. it politely. <laughs> well, I accept this challenge. This will be fun. Let's I'm go. Hoping, I'm hoping that I'm not the only, I hope there's many listeners that are also like, I don't know why we'd bother with that. Holy crap, that sounded like my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Had a few of those no, moments this week. <laughs> it's true, though. A lot of people have no idea. Like, I think it's either they have no idea what a therapist in general can do for someone with dementia, or they think they understand and they just don't see the need. So either encampment you come from, <laughs> I, I'm, I, 
I take on the challenge. Willingly. Okay. So my mo- mostly uneducated, uninformed opinion would be that maybe my mom would have benefited from some of your expertise had we done it earlier, not waiting. Like my dad passed away March, 2017. My mom died March, 2020. So there's only three years where I was the primary responsible person for mom. Mm-hmm. And at that point, now, I think she probably would have lived another two or three years if she hadn't broken her leg. But it's hard to know. She was definitely, there was changes happening before she broke her leg. She had some unobserved falls, and she was getting really quiet. But for, for my, my experience, because you probably don't know this, my mom talked, <laughs> like, in actual words, mm-hmm. and she walked with no aids. And she, one of the challenges that she started having right at the end of life was um, eating. Um, okay. I was not aware that they sometimes felt, the nece- felt it necessary to feed her. I was totally fine with finger foods, like nothing wrong with finger foods. You know, mm-hmm. pizza is a finger food. Not that that's a good choice for somebody with dementia, but, you know, we need to destigmatize eating finger foods when, when we can't use utensils. Sure. Um, what else was the problem? Mostly, mostly it was the eating, but they don't know why she fell. Um, the the leg breaking was because she was totally resisting assistance, and the orneriness caused her to slip and fall. That was totally on my mom. I always make that clarification because mm-hmm. her memory care was fantastic. I know many of them are not as good, and I want to make sure that I never put it out there. The thought that maybe they did something they shouldn't have because they were they were wonderful. So. Yeah, that's great. Knowing that she was in the last stage of Alzheimer's or almost last stage, that's when she started having problems eating. We'll start here. Would you have been able to help her? Because she seriously couldn't remember more than a minute. Yes. Okay. So I, <laughs> I, before, before we get into the specifics, can I give an overview of the different types of therapy and what we do? I think yeah, that, that might would, be a good place to start. Yeah, that would actually be smart. Yeah. So, I think, so there are three types of therapy, um, physical, occupational, and speech therapy. And I'll just give a quick overview of what they do so that we can have a good uh, level playing field as we talk about this. So physical therapy is the most well-known type of therapy. A lot of people understand that physical therapy helps people get back to walking again, right? Recover from an injury. And that's true. So PTs are movement experts. And so whether that be like any part of their body, they can help diagnose and treat any kind of injuries, disabilities, or other health conditions that impair your ability to move. So they help And specifically with people with dementia, they help people to decrease their fall risk. So if they have a balance issue or if they have strength or mobility concerns that puts them at risk for falling, a PT can come in, diagnose that, and then treat it also. So providing exercises, compensatory strategies, or, you know, um, requesting an assistive device. So they are the ones that kind of make the decision if someone needs to be in a wheelchair or if they need a cane or a walker and what kind of walker. So they are experts in assessing someone's ability to move and how we can support them do that more safely. Okay. So occupational therapists, um, are experts in function. So occupation, a lot of times we think about like work in our job, but occupation is more in this sense of the things we do every day. So that includes, toileting, showering, getting dressed, paying your bills, cooking, all of those functional tasks we do every day. Occupational therapists are experts in making sure that we they are diagnosing and treating any kind of issues that affect those abilities. They also help with range of motion and strength and coordination. Um, just like physical therapy, there's a little bit of overlap there. And then um, PT and OT also help with um, endurance. So if someone is very short of breath or they don't have a lot of energy to do things, they can help modify a task. They can also both help with home modifications. So they can come into someone's home and make recommendations to make the areas safer for someone to get around. So where they need to put grab bars or what kind of devices are necessary. And then speech therapy, um, we help in three different areas. So that's communication, swallowing, and thinking skills. 
So communication is not only expressing yourself, like the quality of your voice, the fluency of what you speak and the words that you say, but also comprehending a language. So understanding what other people are saying and reading. And then also for swallowing problems, we anybody who has problems swallowing is considered to have dysphagia. And so we help with as any any problem from where food goes between your lips all the way to where it empties into your stomach. Any issue in that area, we can diagnose and treat. And then also for thinking skills, obviously that's going to be short-term memory, but also attention, uh, problem-solving, or thought organization, planning, um, reasoning. So we assess and diagnose all of those things. So to get back to your question, your mother had problems swallowing. She had problems eating. She didn't have problems swallowing. She had problems getting it from the plate to her mouth. Traditionally would be in the realm of an occupational therapist that is an occupation. So once it passes through the lips, typically a speech therapist kind of takes over. But the overlap that I didn't mention between OT and speech therapy is that we both deal with cognition. Um, speech therapy does deals with cognition and thinking as it relates to communication. And OT relates to um, cognition as it relates to function. So there's a ton of gray areas and it's not really up to a caregiver to understand that. We know our scopes of practice and we know like where the line is drawn. So you don't have to figure out which therapist would work for you. We can do that work for you. But basically, so if your mom is having difficulty getting food to her mouth, then we would be, just implement some compensatory strategies as a speech therapist. Also, we could implement some modifications to her diet. So we would be the ones to write the order between taking her from regular food to a finger foods, or if she needed foods to be a little bit softer, so it stayed on her fork or her spoon a little bit better. We could have done that, but we're making for individuals with dementia. There's a difference between rehabilitation and habilitation. And I think this is where maybe um, this might help you and your kind of skepticism with therapy. So rehabilitation is what we think about a lot when it comes to therapy. We call nursing homes, you know, rehab centers, rehabilitation. It's all about rehab. And the definition of that is basically regaining skills or abilities that were lost due to an injury or illness or a condition. So rehab is taking someone, they have dementia, and we're going to make them regain skills that they've lost because of the disease. If you know anything about dementia, you know that's not possible, right? Like, that's not possible. Dementia is a degenerative disease. It gets worse a little bit every single day. And so we are not rehabbing. We are not rehabilitating. We're not regaining skills. What we are doing as therapists is a different area that's called habilitation. And habilitation is helping people with deficits because of an illness, an injury, or a disease like dementia attain and keep and improve the skills they already have. So as a speech therapist, a lot of times I posted just recently about aphasia, which is difficulty thinking of the words you want to say and expressing yourself or understanding others speech. And I had some comments say, well, we tried speech therapy, but mom didn't get any better or like mom didn't regain her ability to talk for dementia. That's not the goal. So I think it's all really about expectations for, for speech therapy with dementia in that sense our goal would not be to get her to regain the ability to speak. It would be to uh, make her as independent, as functional as possible with the abilities she still has right now. And a lot of times that's just changing the environment around them and educating the caregivers around them and how to support them. And so for your mom, we wouldn't necessarily regain skills that have been lost with dementia. We would have trained the staff in how to cue her to be able to feed herself most independently. Maybe they were coming over and saying, um, Barb, you need to, are you not hungry? Go ahead. Like, are you not hungry? You're not. Okay. Well, we'll just take it. Instead. What they needed to say is, hi, Barb, it's time for lunch. Here's a piece of chicken and put it in her hand. help her move the piece of chicken in her hand to her mouth. You do that 
two or three times, and then maybe she was, she'd be able to take off on her own. But maybe what they were doing instead is either taking the plate away because they thought that she didn't want to eat because she wasn't eating or straight up just feeding her, which I takes think it away. Was, I think it was B. I, yeah, I, I so, was not aware that they were doing that. I was, I would go and have lunch with her once a month or so to kind of gauge where she was at with feeding herself. And so this was New Year's Eve-ish 2019. And so we, we had what, what I did with my mom, cause I finally started listening to the guests that knew better than I did. <laughs> Instead of these long ASS visits, I, this so the Christmas of 2019, I picked my mom up from memory care, put her in my car, drove around the building, got out of the car at the assisted living main entrance, walked in beautiful Christmas trees, decorated the memory care had Christmas decorations as well. Um, just not 25 foot trees or whatever this giant was <laughs> giant two story tree. And we, that day we had, um, sliders, which were perfect. The food there was fantastic. Very much, um, portion control for older adults, little light for me, but probably not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And she struggled a little bit because the burger didn't stay together, but she managed. So I thought, okay, this is interesting, but you know, we all kind of struggle a little bit with the burger sliding apart. So then she fell sometime the next week and she had stitches right above her eye. And I think this might've been one of the problems but I thought that was so successful. Jeez, why is that word hard? Mm -hmm. It was so successful and so enjoyable. We had this lovely Christmas lunch. You know, it was literally about an hour from picking her up to taking her back to the memory care. <clears throat> and, you know, just one simple Christmas gift. Just I kept it so simple. It was lovely. I'm like, why haven't I done this before? Duh. People have <laughs> been telling me this for a couple of years now. So I thought, okay, let's repeat the same thing. I waited an extra day from the day she fell because, you know, kind of a little tr dramatic that day. And they, for whatever reason, not, were not able to get a hold of me, even though they had multiple phone numbers. So she ended up at the ER by herself, which was super frustrating. But, you know, stuff happens. And so we went, did the same thing, picked her up, drove around the building, yada, yada. And it was um, beef tips and noodles, which is something she totally loves. I am not kidding you. That woman pushed more of that stuff off the plate and then she'd move the plate and fuss, 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 fuss over the mess to the point where it was like, eat it off the goddamn table. I don't care. You're making me mm -hmm. insane with the constant, just the fussy, 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 fussy. It was like, oh, and she got so mad at me because I kept saying, do you, you know, do you want something that's easier to eat? You know, I, I knew she would not let me feed her because she thought I was her best friend. So, you know, you don't really want your best friend feeding you. And, oh, my God, it was a disaster. It was so bad. Somebody else had to put her in my car. She was so mad at me. And yeah. all, and I, I didn't do anything. I just kept asking her, do you want something different? Can I help you? You know, it wasn't like forcing myself on her. So it was totally ugly. <laughs> So. Yeah, and I mean, I'd say from her experience, it was probably frustration because she wanted to be independent and like, she hated that that was like happening. That, that is a very embarrassing situation when it's a special dinner and they're, they still have some sense of that sometimes. And, and in that story that you, that you told, like with her pushing food off her plate, like my first thought is we have plates for that. We have plates that have rims that are that stick on the bottom so that they don't slide around. And so that's as a therapy minded person, as a therapist, that's immediately the kind of interventions we would do, right? We wouldn't reteach her how to use a fork. Instead, we would just modify the plate, modify the, the, where she's sitting, like how much the food is cut up, whatever it might be so that we can keep her independent so that she can attain, keep those skills for as long as possible. And, and that's really where the interventions come in, not necessarily to, you know, we're not um, training her because I know you're one of your uh, concerns were that she would tell someone, you know, hit the road. Like, I don't I don't want to see like I'm not doing anything you tell me to do. 
these kind of modifications don't require even telling her anything or changing her behavior. It's just changing everything around her so that she is more functional. Yeah, I did consider ordering the plates that you're talking about with the big rim on the back, but I was not sure how this, this was my biggest struggle probably in the last four or so months of her life was how do I implement things that I think would help her, which would obviously help the staff without burdening the staff. Like my mom needed a purpose. My mom needed something to do, even though she was in the last stages of Alzheimer's, she was still pain in the ass <laughs> and she yeah. really, she needed, you know, but she, her short term memory was so bad that you could ask her to do something and she'd say, Oh, okay. And then, you know, it wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so I was grappling with how do I work through this when she fell and broke her leg, which was March 8th, 2020, we all know what was going on that month. And so everything got yeah. taken out of my hands because I had an excellent relationship with the executive director and the um, director of the memory care. So I was mostly working through like, okay, these are the things I think I need to implement, but how do I do that without making it a problem for them? Like, okay, oh, we have to find Diane's special plate because the way her memory care worked was the um, food came over from the assisted living dining room kitchen. Um, and they used red plates, which I'm thinking now in the assisted living, they didn't 99% certain they're white. Now I'm going to have to go look at some pictures. So that's, so they, they had that much and I'm sure they would have worked with me, but it was like, I didn't want to, they were already short staffed and I didn't want to make things harder, but I wanted to make things easier for mom, which make the, it was just like, pfft. Was it just like oh, this circle thought process that never got, went anywhere? <laughs> no, and I totally get it. And, and my response to that is, Jennifer, that should have never been your job. That's not your, that's not your job. As a caregiver, you're there to spend time with her, to connect with her, to just be a, a supportive person for her. And those kind of things like implementing new interventions, even purchasing of the plates, that shouldn't be your job. As a, as a therapist, um, when I was working in skilled nursing and in memory care, if I identified that someone might benefit from a plate, I had the facility buy it. I implemented it during my sessions. And what we call that are just trials. So we trial it. We see if it works, if it makes her more frustrated, or if it makes her more independent. We try it multiple you know, different times with different types of food, different times of the day. And if we see that it is successful, then it is up to us to write the order for it, to train the staff to use it, to make them understand that this is not just for convenience or like for appearance or aesthetics. This is to keep her as independent as possible. This is a medical recommendation. And so it should, it would be up to the therapist to do all of that staff training to figure out the logistics. And a lot of times in a lot of buildings, we order them ourselves if it's a therapy, you know, uh, order and it shouldn't be up to the family. Although in some assisted livings, they require families to purchase those kind of things. But regardless, when someone is in a facility and modifications need to be made to the environment or to training, a therapist absolutely should be responsible for that. They need to be involved in to do that kind of training. So when you worked in memory care, were you hired by the community? I worked for a company that was contracted into the community. So because, we had an office inside the building. Okay. Because one of the things in doing this show that I have learned, this is really super annoying, because you know I live in California, and I'm going to just say it, we all know that the sun revolves around our state. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like I, My husband is from New York, and I joke I never learned geography because one understands that California is the center of the universe and the sun revolves around us. So that is my joke. I don't really seriously believe that. Um, we do not have any kind of therapists in memory care. We do not have any kind of doctors, none of that. And it makes me like lose my ever living mind because some of that would have made my life so much easier. Cause I felt like, and I've made this comment before I was the captain of mom's care team and they did a great job, but, her being in memory care did not absolve me of being responsible for her, which I think a lot of people think that's an, a thing. 
but you were saying I shouldn't have had to come up with these plans. And I agree, but that wasn't part of their, I don't know, what they offered, even though my mom was paying over $6,000 a month to live there. And then after she broke her leg, it was going to go up to like $7,300, but <laughs> she passed away March 31st and the new fee was supposed to take care, take effect April 1st. So 99% certain my mom knew that the crap was happening and she was out. <laughs> that was just the way my mom would have been. So I have to, you know, a lot of people say, you know, it must have been tough to lose somebody during the pandemic, which is true. But in the long run, it was a serious blessing. But it's really frustrating that, you know, California is the most populous state in the union. And we have got these memory cares, these expensive, wonderful communities, and they don't offer these services. It's like, what the hell? That makes me insane. Well, there are a few different, yeah, there are a few different like models for therapists inside of communities. One model is, especially in skilled nursing facilities, we see that the therapists actually work for the building that so those are considered in-house therapists so um, skilled nursing facilities or nursing homes that have a rehab center they will pretty much always have therapy um, present because that's the whole reason people go there is after an injury to get therapy and get better but you're right in assisted living it is not necessarily um, just assumed that some that they're going to have therapy therapists on site in those facilities. If they do, they're likely contracted in like the company I worked for. But the other option, even if they're not inside the facility, you can get home health therapy inside a memory care community. So I don't know if that was ever offered to you, but nope. that is absolutely, <laughs> that is that is the model that most assisted livings and memory care communities have. And so home health, just as you think about it out in the community where a therapist can come into your home and provide therapy services because these people with dementia, their home are these apartments inside assisted livings that qualifies them for home health. So a lot of memory care communities have a contract with a home health therapist or company and therapists will come in from the community and provide those same services and still provide the staff training and the education and implement those kind of interventions inside a memory care. So if someone finds themselves in your situation where no one has ever talked to them about therapy, or there has never been any offering of that, I would highly recommend asking, can I get a home health therapist come in here and see my mom for these services? Because to qualify for home health in the United States through Medicare, you have to be deemed homebound. And homebound just means that you have, it could takes a considerable or taxing effort to get them out into the community. We think about that a lot of times as physically, like when someone has a lot of physical issues and it's really physically hard to get them out, but the same can be true if it's a cognitive. So if it takes a lot of work cognitively to get them out of the building, to make sure that they're safe, that they don't wander off, that it's a, it's a whole ordeal getting them yep. to go anywhere. <laughs> that's yeah. Most, most dementia caregivers are like, yep, that's, that's mom. Right. So if that is true for you, it's difficult to get them out and they don't just like gallivant around the community. As long as it's only for specific issues, then they are, they can be considered and deemed homebound even though they're not bed bound. So if they will qualify for home health services and a home health therapist can come in and provide that those kind of treatments, even if the facility itself doesn't offer therapy. So I'm sorry that nobody ever offered that to you. <laughs> yeah, it makes me want to go smack her, her former doctors around a little more. My experiences with them were not great. Her neurologist was was good. Um, she spent a lot of time with her patients, which is great, but she was always like an hour behind. Mm -hmm. So I had to work around that, but that after waiting in the waiting room with my mom for an hour, the first once then it was like, I checked in the next time and I said, how far behind is the doctor? They told me. And I said, great, we're going across the parking lot to get something to drink because she will become very agitated and irritated waiting for you guys. So we're just going to like text me. 10 minutes or so before I need, you know, so I can start making my way back. They did it, worked great. 
but it was still kind of frustrating because, you know, sure. if you showed up at three and your appointment was at two thirty, they were mad, even though the doctor was an hour behind, it was just like a whole thing. <laughs> but, um, yeah, her, the, her general physician she'd had for years left the practice and we had a really nice doctor, but he was so clueless. <laughs> mm. It was well, like, I'm... he, he always seemed to me, he always gave me the impression that he didn't understand why we were there. He couldn't fix her. He couldn't cure her. And dealing with the two of us was a pain in the butt. And it just, I just, even though he was smiling and he was friendly and the tone of voice was great and he never, ever said anything negative or derogatory, I just always got this impression of like, oh my God, why are you here? (laughs) Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Well, and you bring up a good point. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a good point because doctors a lot of times are not referring people with dementia to any kind of services that might make your life as a caregiver easier and might preserve their abilities longer. I hear all the time where people will message me and they'll say, I asked my doctor for speech therapy after hearing what you say about how it can be beneficial. And he says, there's no point. And it shouldn't be up to caregivers to educate doctors about the importance of, of these habilitation services, because it's, it should be up to them to understand that. But a lot of therapists or a lot of doctors don't refer for therapy. They don't understand what we do when it comes to people with dementia. And I hope that I can be a part of the conversation to change that. Um, But I think another thing I want to highlight about how we can help, it relates back to what you talked about your mom, how the reason she fell, which is that she was kind of being Mm non-compliant or, you know, (laughs) That's a polite way of putting it. (laughs) (laughs) So she might've been resistive during care. And that is a huge part of the therapy services that I provide because let's say we're showering someone. I don't know what the situation was for her, but it was the shower. Okay. (laughs) I figured that's usually it. Um, I actually, I've created a showering course all about like how to get someone with dementia to shower with more compliance. But the reason why, I think it's so important that a therapist is involved in these kind of things where people with dementia are showing resistance is because, especially as a speech therapist, the main issue is typically communication. So I can give you an example. I have a man who I was, uh, that never wanted to shower. He was very different, difficult to understand when he spoke and he, I knew he didn't quite understand everything that I said, but when an aide would come in there and they would try to take his clothes off and get him in the shower, he had no assistive device. He was strong as an ox. He could, he could really hurt people. And so there were three, two or three girls always going in there and just, you know, working as fast as they can, avoiding his swings and his, his grabbing and and hitting and just I mean, manhandling him is the best way I can put it into the shower, getting it done. And it was difficult. It was putting him at risk of her falling because he was terrified and he was swinging everywhere. The, the floor was wet. He was naked. Everybody was, it was a whole ordeal. 
Um, and the staff, of course, were put at risk because they were going to be injured and it, it had already happened. And so as a speech therapist, I know that his ability to express himself and his needs was very limited and his ability to understand what we're asking of him was very limited. And his short term memory was maybe 15 seconds on a good day. Super <laughs> short. So what I noticed of him is that like I always talk to caregivers about finding what motivates them and working with that to get them to do the things we need to do. And so I know that from helping him that he would go to the toilet and pee, but he, that would be the only time that he would take off his pants. He never would take off his pants other than that. So I knew that if we were going to get him to get in the shower, it had to be, we had to catch him in that moment where he was going into the bathroom to pee. And so I also knew that when we help him get dressed after a shower, sometimes he would put on some pants that were too tight for him because he might, he's gained a little weight over time. And that was another time that he would take willingly take off his pants as if he went to go button them and they didn't come together at the front. And so he would willingly take off his pants. So I combined these two pieces of information. So when he would go to the toilet and pee, I would act like I was helping him pull up his pants, but I would pinch the back of it really tight so that the front would not close. And he thought the pants were too tight. And so I didn't have to say, take off your pants, take off your pants and tell him a thousand times because verbal communication didn't work for him. I had to show him and use the things that already motivated him to get to take his pants off to do that. So I'd pinch the back of his pants. He would see that they didn't fit and he would willingly take them off. Then I would just pat the shower bench and I'd say, sit right here. I'll go get you some other pants. He would sit down and I wouldn't go get him pants. I would get a warm washcloth. We would start rubbing it on his legs. He would feel how warm it is. We would work a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time till we removed a uh, one shoe and then we removed one sock and the whole time we're doing lots of visual cues and and using my tone of voice because I knew he understood that more so than even the words I was saying to go ooh, that feels nice that's so warm and that was the process in which we got him to shower and it was not it took one person because once he was in there and he understood what was happening he didn't fight it was just that girls were going in there out of the blue, trying to take off his clothes and he got really upset. So communication is not just using our words, it's using the environment, using all the things that motivate him. And so my big, a lot of how I spend my time with people with dementia is problem solving these combative, aggressive, resistant behavior and taking what I know about their communication skills and working that into my session. So then I can train other caregivers who don't have the time or maybe the skills to figure that out so that they can get care done more easily. Because my, well, I can almost guarantee you it was a similar scenario with my mom. I know it was two caregivers. My mom had gotten to the point where the more help she needed, the more she was resistant. Mm -hmm. And when people assisted her with, with her not necessarily being willing, her reaction was to claw people. She drew blood mm -hmm. on a couple of caregivers multiple times. She drew blood on my husband. Mm -hmm. It was not fun. And with my husband, he he didn't even he didn't even force her. We had to because when she fell, you know, she had stitches right above her eye, and a week later she was having a lot of pain walking. So I get mm. her to the doctor. The first one's like, she's weight bearing. She didn't break a hip. It's not a big deal. And I'm like, dude, she went from zero to 10 on the pain scale in a week. It's not arthritis. And they kept trying to tell me it was arthritis. I'm like, he's full of crap. People are you know, like, I'm not a doctor. And I know this is baloney. <clears throat> when she fell and broke her leg, they found a healing fracture on her pelvis. Mm. Shocker. Woman was in pain. So she was being a pain in the butt. But well, we we got an x-ray when they were doing her hips, so that wasn't successful. She was so resistant, I had to coerce her onto the x-ray table, and then she wouldn't get up. I mean, it was like, it was kind of a comedy of embarrassments, but she we had like literally people poking their head and going, what the hell's going on in here? It's like, mm -hmm. this old lady won't get off the exam table. So I called my husband, who was really good at sweet-talking her, and 
she was so pissed off at me and I left the room. I'm like, as soon as she doesn't see me, maybe we'll like chill out and forget that I coerced her. And he's like, he reaches out and he says, come on, like, let's, let's get the hell out of here. Okay. And she just, just raked no, down his no. arm. He was so pissed. And she weighed all of about a hundred pounds. He literally picked her up and plopped her in the wheelchair because it hurt to walk. So distances were a problem. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. lovely. So I'm pretty sure the shower scenario was similar. They mm-hmm. claimed that she reached for her clothes and slipped. I can guarantee you she didn't reach. She probably, you know, man, snatched. I mean, it, there was probably a lot of jerky body movements in there. And I always thought, you know, like if they had had more time to deal with her in a more, you know, positive way, then, you know, but they already were over understaffed. And, mm-hmm. but no, knowing that you can man- make that happen with one, it's like, okay, well, right there, you've just, you've just given 50% of the staff back to other people. So that's, yeah, memory care places need to know this. And then I was going to yeah, ask, exactly. I was going to ask you, so I think she probably started having fall issues. Because she had the really bad hunched back mm-hmm. and she watched her feet when she walked. And that, that was becoming a bigger problem. Like when I would take her out because she would not hold my hand or my elbow or walk next to me. I have learned that she was probably trying to keep an eye on what was going on around her because she was the oldest of four children. So she was in charge. She was keep probably keeping an eye on the kids. Uh-huh. Air quotes. I was the kid. I mean, I was the, I am the kid, was the kid, but it was so frustrating that I could never get her to even walk near me. She'd literally walk, walk 10 or 15 feet behind me. Mm. Ugh, it was awful because I'm like, one of these days this woman's going to face plant on the sidewalk and everybody's going to think I'm the big, you know what, because I wouldn't let her catch up and that was mm-hmm. not the problem. But I would literally go, oh, look at the pretty clouds and oh look at the bird i'm like i was always doing things to direct her gaze up because yeah. she literally walked bent at about a third there was a gal a gal in her memory care residence that literally walked bent over in half like an l yeah so mm-hmm. from her waist to her head top of her head was parallel to the floor and they mm-hmm. literally and she would not sit So they literally, somebody had to hire a caregiver to literally walk in circles with this woman. No, thank you. So what would you do for some, because like my mom had no, no known balance issues, walked just fine with no aids, but did have a tendency to watch her feet. So what, what would you do in that scenario to maybe have prevented a couple of the falls that I think sped up the end of her life? Yeah, it's, that would definitely be another realm of a physical therapist, but I can speculate as to what might have happened there. So what you described sounds like kyphosis. That's kind of that rounded back posture. Um, and it's very common, especially in women um, with you know osteoporosis and things like that. So um, for someone who does have that kind of bent over posture, their center of gravity is not going to be um, kind of like at our hip level, like most women have. Um, it's going to be more forward. So she, if she was going to fall, she would likely fall forward because most of her body weight was shifted forward. So even though she didn't necessarily have obvious balance issues, it could have been that she could have benefited from an assistive device. Now a walker, she might not have liked, um, we, they could have probably tried a rollator with her, which is a four wheeled, um, thing with a, a seat on it. Those are much more customizable and not as old air quotes, old person looking, <laughs> um, there are a million types of different rollators with different, um, designs and things like that. So I imagine they would have trialed a lot of those with her. And even if, um, even if something like that didn't work, I've seen people use baby strollers or some kind of like buggy, some, especially if she didn't need to weight bear through her arms, like she didn't necessarily need something super stable, that she just needed something in front of her to keep her from pushing that weight forward so much. You know, maybe they could have tried those kind of alternative ideas. I've also seen people use hiking sticks 
obviously for people who might have had a past history using those, that might be a little bit more comfortable. So there are a lot of different options that can be tried. And um, I think I imagine that would be that would be the route that they would take. Also, people with those kind of forward posture, we also recommend that they not wear hats or even certain hairstyles, maybe with bangs that might include the upwards, like the ability to look upwards. So just education on things like that. A lot of men who walk stooped, we had one who would always consist, um, insist on wearing a ball cap, mm -hmm. uh, but we always had to turn it to the back because like the bill to the back. And um, as long as he had it on, he didn't care. But with him being stooped and he have that bill, it really cut off the amount that he could see around him. So those are the kind of things, that's the kind of glimpse into a therapist's mind of all the different little things that we could try um, and train other people in considering, because that's not typically something that people think about. And earlier you mentioned, you know, when I was talking about the shower, about how like the aides don't necessarily have the time to figure those things out. Mm -hmm. And that's the best thing about a therapist is that we bill Medicare or insurance for our services most of the time. And we have the ability to spend 30, 45 minutes, an hour. I've spent two hours with patients before one-on-one. -on -one. And so we have the time to try all of these things in a very controlled environment. And the goal is not for us to take over showering this person for the rest of their life, <laughs> but is to try all of these different ideas and these different approaches and change the environment. So when we find something that starts to work, we can then transfer all of that information over to a caregiver so they can do it, like you said, with using one person rather than two, which could be a huge deal for someone, a place that's understaffed. Oh yeah. We know all of them are understaffed at this point in the, in the time, time frame, but no, that's okay. So we started off with me being skeptical. I am no longer skeptical. So congratulations. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and that's why I like Very to have good. these conversations because I was going to ask if you um, build through Medicare. So Medicare mm -hmm. does pay for it. So I being in California, don't know why, you know, again, we're the center of the universe, why I'd have to demand this, but now any of my audience that's also in the golden state knows to ask, don't, don't demand right off the bat, but <laughs> you know, and to just explain why you think this might be beneficial because it's going to better everybody's quality of life. And that was my, always my goal with my mom was to give her the best quality of life without extending dying from Alzheimer's, which is really quite challenging. Sure. And I, I think a lot of people don't, they, they get caught up in trying to fix things and there's a lot of stuff you can't necessarily fix, but you've yeah. explained to me how we can make it better. So I'm and, really and excited. Yeah, I want to <laughs> say... I think two caveats first is that you have to have a doctor's order to get mm -hmm. therapy. And so the, if you think that you, your loved one could benefit from therapy, the first step is to go to the primary care physician and ask for them to refer. And so they can decide there's also, we talked about home health and then like an inpatient model where someone's in a nursing home, but also someone could go to outpatient therapy. If it's a, person with dementia who can get out and go to a building and, and go to a clinic. That's also an option. But yeah, number one, we need a doctor's order. And number two, we talked earlier about like how some doctors that your mom experienced were better with her than others, right? Or they understood her needs a little bit better than others. And you're going to find the same thing in therapists. And that is another pushback that I hear most for from caregivers when I talk about therapy is, well, dad tried therapy and it didn't work or dad tried therapy and that therapist was so rude and didn't do anything to help us. Here's the thing in medical field and in general in the world, we're going to see really good hairstylists that are really good and talk to us the way we want to be talked to and have a really good rapport and are very professional. And then you're going to have some that aren't. It's the same in the therapy world. So if you 
request therapy and you have someone enter into your home or enter into the room of the person with dementia uh, nursing home and they don't click well and you don't like the way that they are interacting with your loved one, whatever the reason might be, it's okay to ask for someone else. Now in rural areas, that might not always be an option, but just know just because you've had a bad experience with the one therapist, that doesn't mean that therapy in general doesn't work. And so I'm always hesitant to like always recommend therapy because I'm like, man, there are some bad therapists out there, just like any other profession. And so I don't want people to just lose hope in the theory of therapy because of bad interaction with one person. That makes sense. And you mentioned earlier that you have a course on showering. So I want to, um, I'm going to link that in the show notes because if we are in a position where the doctor doesn't want to refer us to any kind of therapy or like my husband had home health for a while um, for wound care on his foot, these people did not understand that first off, they don't come anymore because he's not homebound at all. Um, he should be sit- getting keeping off of his foot, but he doesn't do that very well either. Um, but they would literally call and say, well, I could be there in an hour. And it's like, um, no, I'm sorry. I have work to do. It's like, I'm mm-hmm. not, not just sitting here waiting for you people to just drop in. So our experience with home health is not positive. Um, so I would, I, my thought process is if you, if, if a caregiver, like if I had known about your course or your course was available before we had this situation with my mom, cause showering was becoming more and more of an issue, um, as her disease progressed, which is really interesting. If I had taken your course, maybe I could have helped her, her primary caregiver in the memory care residence. And so I think that might, that might be a really good option. We need as many options as we can get. That's, that's kind of my takeaway here. And I'm really super excited that you've convinced me. (laughs) Oh, good. I am too. I'm glad this has been a successful conversation. But yeah, my course is coming out in September of 2022. And it's just about how to shower someone with dementia. I talk about, you know, why showering is important, but also the the different types of dementia, the different stages of dementia and the unique challenges that come with each. And then I list 11 reasons why people with dementia don't want to shower and interventions for each of those reasons. So if we are, if we think that our loved one is cold and then we change everything up so that they're not cold and that was never the issue to begin with, then we're not going to be successful, right? So I teach you how to figure out what the reason is why they don't want to shower and then what to do once you figure that out. We talk about some alternatives to bathing. If you can't get them to shower product reviews and all kinds of other stuff. So it is, I'm I'm teaching you how to think like a therapist and problem solve yourself if you don't have access to one. So I think that that will be super helpful and I'm really excited to get it out. Awesome. Well, this will definitely come out after that comes out. So people will be able to go to Adria's website that is also linked in the show notes. Check on that. And you were talking about products, and I do have a very fantastic sponsor. Um, Pharmacy Wipes has excellent bathing cloths. You just wet them. Yes. And my husband's actually used it to keep his foot clean that he can't get wet in the shower. Mm -hmm. They have um, rinse-free shampoo and body wash, which I used on a camping trip earlier this year when we didn't have the trailer connected to water and I have a lot of hair. So, (laughs) you know, it's not like I I have never been super successful with like the dry shampoo routine and this stuff gets your hair wet, but you could dry it or like with my mom, they weren't drying her hair anymore because there's, you know, that's a whole other challenge that you don't want to take on risk burning them with the hair dryer. Probably my mom wouldn't have accepted it anyway. But it's like, I've used it. It works amazing. So yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of alternatives. And we also need to understand that as we age, we don't necessarily, well, not even as we age, but unless we're getting dirty and sweaty, we don't Mm -hmm. necessarily have to shower every day. That's right. Absolutely. I don't shower every day and I'm, I do get sweaty. So, you know, whatever. I I almost do, but (laughs) there's some times when it's like, well, it's, you know, I've, I've already had lunch, so I'll just, you know make sure that I don't smell and make sure my teeth are clean and I'll just worry about it tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow's another day and nobody yeah, those has products. Those products could be lifesavers. That's, that's great. 
Yeah, and the bathing cloths that pharmacy wipes sell, they're pretty big. They're like mm-hmm. 10 by 8, 6 by 10 maybe. I don't have to measure them next time hubby opens them up. But this has been fantastic. I appreciate that you asked me if I would be interested in having you on the show. And because, and I was, I just was waiting. Um, my queue is pretty full, but I'm hoping to release five episodes a month for a while till I, till I get the backlog clear. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate your time so much. It's been really fun and it's good to kind of meet you officially. That's true. I know it's like, it's really strange. I've met a couple of internet friends in person this year. Um, I'm going to Southern California for the Rose Bowl parade and I get to meet two more so oh, it's fun. it's like really wild to have all these quote unquote internet friends. Yeah. You know, it's like you meet people like, oh, you look, you have legs. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of weird, but it's been fun. So I appreciate it. And again, if you're not following Adria on Instagram, and I guess you're on TikTok too. I'm not on TikTok. Yeah. Okay. So and, yeah, TikTok and Facebook. Okay. I do Facebook, mm-hmm. but mostly just through a scheduler, but definitely Instagram and or TikTok. She's got fantastic videos. And like I said, I linked her account in the show notes. These videos are like, what, a minute, two minutes long, and you will learn some good stuff. So go there, go to her website. And I want to thank you once again for joining me today. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.